We're with Joshua Paul right now. Thank you so much, Joshua, for joining us on The Light Breakfast. So you are a freelance cameraman. And uh, so today we're actually talking to people who are in the essential services who hardly gets mentioned, but you do so much for all of us during this whole CMCO and MCO period. So before we move on, Joshua, maybe you can tell us about your job as a freelance cameraman before the MCO happened. Um, before the MCO happened, what will I be usually doing is I'll be looking for new pieces that I can do, like documentaries, short, doc, short documentaries and stuff. And what I usually do is I'll pitch it to the clients that I usually work with. Uh, so one of my reg regulars that I work with is Vice, Vice News. Mm. Uh, and then my other regulars would be like Washington Post, Al Jazeera, BBC, and so forth. But so uh, usually what I'll do is I'll just try to look as many pieces I can do around in Asia. And then I'll just pitch to the clients and then write up the brief, write up the work on our budgets and stuff to get that piece up, uh, to be approved before we could start filming it. So that's usually what I do. Uh, look for a story, write up the pitch, send it in, get clients to, uh, to assign me to do it, and then go out, film it, do the interviews, wrap it up. Sometimes I edit the piece by myself. Sometimes certain clients don't. So you just send them all the stuff that you film, and then they probably do the editing on their own on their end. Yeah. So Is that's this a one-man show? You do it all on your own? Yep. As a freelance producer, he's also a cameraman. Wow. Yeah. Kudos. But how has things changed since the MCO started? First of all, all the other stories around Asia have been cancelled for now or put on hold. Can't travel. I have to turn down a couple as well. That I, I, like initially, uh, in February, I was supposed to be in South Korea, China and Singapore, uh, which I had to turn it down because before COVID, before the MCO happened, I contracted H1N1 during oh one of God. the documentary shoots I was doing for oh my God. Undercover Asia. Yeah, so I contracted H1N1, which went on for like 14 days because it was halfway through the shoot. Mm. Uh, but to the final bit of the shoot, I had to like just tell the producer who was working with me at the time, told her like, sorry, I got to get you a, a, another friend of mine to help me to wrap up the shoot. Uh, so that was what happened that because I had the H1N1, which even after I got better, I somehow quarantined myself for another 14 days. Uh, by the time I was ready to travel to execute my other shoots, then lo and behold, the lockdown happened. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. So with, with H1N1, you are high risk because your immunity would be low at that time, right? So you are, are, you, are you a bit more careful when you heard of COVID-19? Uh, yeah, when I had the H1N1, I, I, actually I didn't even know what I had you know, after only like day number eight. It was just so bad because I was filming and I was pulling focus on the camera. While I was pulling focus, I noticed through my viewfinder, like why is the shot so shaky? Right, so I did. A so it's your of hand is like, shaking. You just yeah, I was shivering already at that time. So no. that was what happened, right? So what so you didn't realize was, that your your high fever was just not the regular high fever. I knew I was not feeling well, but I just didn't know the to the extent of it. I mean, like people like us, most of the time we try to finish the day at at the very least Push because through. one stuff are being assigned we have planned it out well the interviews the stuff you're gonna film you always try to push it through you know but at five o'clock i just had to tell the producer like look man look at the shot this is just not doing well uh so what happened was subsequently when i finally got and got myself checked at sunway medical i think at that time uh even the doctors thought it was covid <laughs> like they're like where did you go where did you travel give us all your all your travel details for the past couple of weeks uh so, but I was glad enough, like the following, even when the lockdown happened, even before the lockdown happened, when I was flying out, the executive, pro uh, executive producer in Vice News that I worked for, he was really chill about it. He was like, hey man, just take it easy. Uh, the assignment is to yours, the, you know, take mm -hmm. your time, feel better before we execute it. Uh, and then that's when the lockdown happened. But that's that's not usually how other companies would do it, right? I mean, that's that's really unusual, and that's really nice of them to actually let you continue doing it, right? 
Uh, yeah, that is very true. Uh, but then again, as well, because I've been freelancing for Vice News regularly for about three years now, uh, since they started their out their outreach in Asia when they were focusing more on Asia a bit. So I was freelancing from them since mm-hmm. then. So I think that relationship that, that you have with the clients and to let them know for a fact, like what is their what's their role as a client and what's your role as someone who's supposed to film for. So I think that relationship helps in a bit that mm-hmm. clients are understanding. And also, I think the international clients are more particular when it comes to uh, health and safety. Mm. You know, like they are more particular in that sense, maybe it's just how they work with most of the time, uh, that they make sure that the people that they work with are well taken care of as well. And that is evident during the MCO, you were actually out of work for the first four weeks because all these major news network, they had to work out their risk analysis and have an SOP in place for all their staff and their vendors. So how badly affected were you financially by being out of work for mm. the first four weeks? To be real on, honest, not as bad because uh, being as someone who has worked in the news industry for a while now. So before I became a freelancer, I was a, photo, a photojournalist with AP the Associated Press in Malaysia. Okay. So I think having the background of working in news probably helped you to see like how bad this is going to be. Mm-hmm. So I have really like started saving up even in January, like preparing, making sure that I have enough to get through this time. Uh, and I think that helped a, help a lot being able to predict what the news change is going to happen, right? Yeah. I remember that, uh, well, I... Bloomberg editor who contacted me to do was to actually photograph Ton Mahate, I think five days before the lockdown. Uh, yeah, and I was having a chat with the Bloomberg editors like, hey man, like, let's do whatever we, we need to do. And I was already telling him like maybe, because he's as, as well as a friend, so I was telling him as a friend like, hey bro, maybe you should start buying some food and stuff to keep. And he was like, I are you sure there's going to lockdown going to happen? I'm like, man, read the news, man. Everywhere else is moving the same way, right? Like mm-hmm. every other con- countries, right? Like it's mm-hmm. almost like an outbreak and then it led to a lockdown. So true enough, that Friday was announced March the 18th. There was a lockdown. So I think that helped me a lot, a bit to understand how situations like this would change. So yes, I do get lesser jobs now. But to really answer your question, whether I'm financially affected, to be real honest, like it is, it's just that I've somehow anticipated and braced myself for it. Yeah. So did that photo shoot with Tun Mahade go, uh, come through? Yeah, it did. It did come through. Uh, and then this was the fun part. The following week, there was rumors that Mahade had, was uh, contracted COVID because he was in exposure with someone uh, who was tested positive, right? Uh, Bloomberg's boss of Malaysia's office immediately gave me a call like, hey man, uh, some bad news. <laughs> uh, there's a chance that Tun Mahathe may be positive, uh-huh. maybe negative, we don't know. Uh, we are trying to work through our SOPs at this time. We would require you to quarantine yourself. And I was just oh joking before I say like, no big deal because I've been quarantined myself anyway from H1N1. <laughs> so it was like just... A very normal thing, you know, at that time, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, good on you that you had that, uh, you prepared beforehand, especially financially, because I think a lot of freelancers out there didn't expect this to, to go on for so long and they've been out of work for so long. But are you back at work now? Uh, I started working uh, the fourth week of MCO. Uh, so because I don't do breaking news, so I wasn't in the position, I, I don't need to like continue to look for things to film. Uh, it's some of my niche things that, that I do, like I focus more like a shorter form of documentary, like an eight minute or 10 minutes, right? So I don't need to work on breaking news in that sense. Mm. So what happened was I just took that time looking for other kind of news pieces that I can tell on top of what MCO was happening, right? Mm. Uh, so I started going out to recce research pre-interview people to find out on the fourth week and then by the fifth week i went out to film um during the fifth week that's when it's quite interesting in a sense like you start to like 
okay, now I got to read all the SOPs that the client has sent. Yeah. You know, like reading the SOPs from Vice and also I'm part of this association, uh, Act Alliance, is an alliance of freelance around in Asia. Uh, so I did my hostile environment training with them a couple of years back. So they do send us these briefs every now and then. And to have a network with other colleagues around in Asia, like from Philippines, Indonesia. So we do share all the information that we get from all our various clients and try to put it together ourselves to see like what works for us as filmmakers, as a photographer before you go out there. Okay. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you face? When you, when you first head out to the streets to shoot your, your news pieces and your documentaries? Um, me, because now I do more video than photos, so it's, to be real honest, it's really challenging to hold up a camera and to wear an N95 mask and to breathe through it. I think <laughs> that's one of the massive ones. I even have a face mask, the half face mask with the gas, yeah, with the cartridge. Uh, so I tried that first mm. at home. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no way, this is just ridiculous. Like you can't even breathe enough because to hold a very good shot is for us to take our breath in. Like mm -hmm. you know that something won't film and you try to handheld the camera for 40 seconds without breathing, right? So putting the mask on and holding your breath for 40 seconds and then to take the next, next breath before you take the next shot, I, that's just ridiculous. And also and... I suppose interviewing people is a bit strange because everyone's wearing a mask. You can't even hear what they're saying. Um, yeah, that is true. Uh, but what I'm lucky in that sense is because of the clients that I work with and the nature that I work with, we do uh, a lot to request for sound operators. So having a buddy of mine who works with me every now and then is a good sound operator would be, he gives me a, an earphone to plug on to actually listen from his boom mic rather than me trying to listen what people are telling me. So I think that helped. So I think working around all these scenarios, plan, planning your day, right, on what you're going to shoot, who you're going to shoot, what kind of risk you're probably going to face, planning all this, right, working with the crew, tell the sound operator, like, you know, this because what we are doing, I'm going to need this from you. So all that helps. Yeah. Do you fear for your own safety and health when you are out and about working? Yes, because if you're sick, you lose 14 days, you may lose 21 days. And that as a freelance, there's actually loss of income on yeah. the days that you are not available. Uh, being someone who has done breaking news, who's done news and documentary stuff right now is one thing I learned for a fact is to be there when the client wants, to know that when the client calls you that Joshua is ready to go. So if you're sick, being unavailable for 14 to 21 days that is a long time to mm. not be available you know so that one i fear the most and most importantly on top of work is to not bring it back to my dogs mm. uh, i have three rescue dogs uh, so i've always to be real honest i think of them more than myself like thinking like making sure that i desanitize to their family myself. Yeah, before I sanitize myself, before I come in, like I make sure when I go out, I sanitize and wash my car before I park it back in the porch and then sanitize the camera, sanitize the shoes, sanitize my clothes and then chucking them in a pill before I go in the house. So wow. I think all that makes me even more fearful in that sense, you know, because uh, if you have human kids, you can actually just tell them, right? Hey, when I'm home, don't come to me. But dogs, to be able to do all that is a bit tough, you know. So that's one of my second biggest worry. Yeah. But um, was that an SOP that was given to you by these uh, by your clients to wash your cars, tires, or is it something that you do for your for your dogs? Um, clients tell you to sanitize yourself as much as you can before mm. you go back home, and I think being someone who done this. Uh, the logical sense is to make sure you sanitize and leave all the, all the dirty outside before mm. you go into your safe zone. I mean, we try to be as possible, like if you're in a hospital or you're in a lab, that you go through a vacuum room, sanitize and you walk in, right? Because we don't have that at, in a house or most of us wouldn't possibly have a setup like this. So then is to create that buffer zone before you get in the house. So I think that's one bit and the bit that I'm a bit of an OCD as, as well. So 
even the cars like I would want to sanitize them before I drive it into the porch <laughs> but the uh, I mean, tires so, I mean I hear you sanitizing tires and I'm like how do you uh, even do that like spray it <laughs> why or, like, yeah 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 like, like I really spray it I have the I bought a 5 liter bottle of industrial grade sanitizer so I transferred in smaller jars and I spray it on because like for me like I was telling you guys earlier on because my dog stays in the porch they sleep inside the house mm-hmm. so and to think of the possibility of con- of the dog leaning on the tires and then bring it in because mm-hmm. as we went on, we all knew that COVID would probably live on a physical surface up to three to four or five days, right? We don't really know. So I think it's just me being a journalist who likes to over plan, you know, as a producer, cameraman journalist, we like to, o- to over plan. So I think that- But were you a, always a germaphobe OCD before the H1N1 got you or were you always this way? Um, not this bad. I mean, I always like it to be clean because I think it's the way the what we do in our line of work, right? Like you always meet various people. Like when I was in Cox's Bazaar in 2017 for the refugee crisis, uh, we were also given risk assessments. Uh, back then, I went there with Vice News as well. Uh, we were given risk assessments like to make sure you clean your camera down, sanitize it because when you work with people at risk, like refugees, they have a lot of risk that they would probably pass it to you, right? So I think through the work experience, that is somehow just taught me to always do that. But when it came to COVID, it's because like, you just can't see it, right? So it's like times 100. The fear just times 100. Like, got to do these steps to make sure that you're safe in your buffer zone. Mm. Recently, Finas actually issued the, the approval for filming to uh, happen again. Uh, but there were, it's kind of, what are, what were your thoughts on that when did you um, get that, that notification so to draw the difference first fin, finas would uh oversee the commercial side of things uh like filmmakers like me who works on editorial works on news we fall under the press so under the press in malaysia we have our national press cards that we will pre-apply and all that so we are given the permit to work so really to answer your question the finas bit doesn't really affect us because we go under journalism mm-hmm. uh but to probably say is, I think the SOP for theirs will have a long way to go because really a lot more people, right? Even me working with my sound op- sound operator, like telling each other, hey, one, one meter apart. Like we usually just hook the boom mic to a camera on a cable, decide the guy, like, bro, no way, bro. Wireless all the way, you know? So we could always practice that safe dis- distance. So I think, Finas able to do that, it's great. Everyone will get back to work, but SOP is definitely a, a must that must follow to the dot. What are the SOPs in place for journalists and press here in Malaysia? Um, definitely, I can't speak for the rest of them. Uh, again, because I've not done breaking news in a while right now, so I don't find myself in a situation where I'm in a messes, you know. But the SOPs that we were given as freelancers, like for me, I could say specific for me was uh, one of the things, always practice social distance and then sanitizing your camera. Even like our mics, you know, we always have the fluff on the mic. Mm -hmm. We are told not to use that. So they don't mind even the wind sound and all that just to remove any sort of foam, any sort of cotton that probably the virus will be in. Uh, And then handheld as much as you can. So even I do that more right now because then I do not need to carry so many things and risk contaminating more items. Uh, so I think those are the things that change the most that the SOPs have to do is making sure when you leave the house, when you work, you go back in the car, sanitize, come home, buffer zone. Buffer zone goes for everything, your equipment, your shoes, your clothes. Mm. Okay. What is your... Do you find it a little troublesome to do all these things right now? Yes. But if this is the new normal and we have to continue doing this for at least till the rest of the year. I guess we would just adapt. I think our kind, the mankind, we are really good at adapting. You know, everyone is very good at adapting. I mean, we may hate it, but I'm pretty sure we will adapt. I would adapt. I have to. Mm. Uh, if I don't work, there's no source of income. So that's not good there. Uh, 
yeah, I think we just got to just adapt and move on. But yeah, I do really not like it because besides the SOP, what thing that it really does, it puts a barrier between you as a filmmaker to interview. You know, when you're interviewing someone, you do not get to be close contact. You do not get to see their face. You do not get to see you. Mm. I think that the bottom line is to me, I think that really affects the most especially when you're doing, doing like documentary stuff where you take a little bit more in spending more time with people to find out more than rather a normal news piece would do. Mm. But having that barrier, that limit really bothers me in that sense because you just can't build that relationship anymore for mm. people to trust you, to open up to you, to talk on the camera, right? Mm. I think that really bothers me in that sense. Yeah, because you have to be behind the mask and people can only see your eyes, huh? Yeah. What is your advice then to sort of other frontliners who hardly get recognized for their efforts like yourself during, during this whole pandemic season? Um, I think the only advice is to just adapt, 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 and following the SOPs. The faster we adapt, the faster we go back to our new norm the faster everyone can go back to work and everything else I think will just fall in place once we get the ball, the ball rolling. Mm. Speaking of the new norm though, I mean, usually I know how, how you guys, the freelancers, how they work. You like to plan well ahead, six months, a year ahead with projects back to back so that it's always uh, a constant flow of income. How are you planning this considering that there's so many unknowns right now? you don't, <laughs> you just don't plan. Like you're just really hoping for the best, you know, like what, like we used to have this term in the news world when you're taking photos, like just click as much as you can, just pray hill right? and hoping that you get that one, that one shot that you want. I think it's the same thing here. You just really can't plan because you really don't know. Um, but I think one more advice is to other freelancers is to be ready to work. Uh, because if this goes longer, what would potentially happen is the travel would be limited. So people who are good at what they do in local positions, you really need to be able to work when the client wants. So I think that really would be the next change because it probably take about a year more or so, six to more, six months to one, to one whole year before we can actually fly, before we can we can actually tra travel because. I think one of the shoots I was doing, I was planning to do, hopefully by later part of the year, client and I was talking about now we have to factor in cost of the 14 days, the 14 days quarantine. Who is paying for that? Client is paying or I as a freelancer, I, I have to pay that by myself. 